Hey there, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining again our third series of Shop Talk. So just a reminder of, you know, Shop Talks is really uh, our effort to bring more manufacturing-centric topics um, without kind of the autodesk flair, if you will, um, into our space. And, you know, just really raise all of our education and awareness around all things manufacturing. Today, we're delighted to have Al Watmo join us, and he's going to talk to us about subtractive manufacturing, uh, machining, cam, uh, these types of things. You know, we hear a lot about additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing. So um, Al is going to expand our vocabulary to include uh, subtractive and talk through a lot of the different elements of what that means. Al? So I wanted to start by just comparing the differences between uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing and subtractive which is uh, the CNC stuff. I brought two parts. We'll start passing them around, and then uh, we can take a quick look at them. One's uh, 3D printed, and the other one is uh, done on the Haas CNC machine, so it's uh, subtractive. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the different machining processes, the types of machines. Again, try and expand some vocabulary, uh, some processes. I want to show you a bit of marketing data. I put Q&A at the end, but uh, I always like if people ask questions along the way when you have the inspiration, go ahead and ask. I'm sure there's five other people that didn't ask the same question, so uh, please ask the question. So to, to start with, uh, what is 3D printing versus uh, CNC machining? And really it comes down to an additive process where you're building material up, which is the, what we talk about 3D printing or additive. You start with a vat of material or a spool of material and it, it grows the part. Uh, subtractive is you're taking, you're taking material away. So uh, the shiny metal part that we're passing around uh, started as a billet of aluminum. So a block of aluminum goes into the machine and you take away what you don't want. I actually have a, a family friend and his analogy works about the best, but uh, he carves totem poles and bears. He's known as the bear man. He does chainsaw art. And I once asked him, how do you, how do you carve a, a bear? He told me it's easy. I just carve away what's not a bear from the tree. But it's, it's essentially the same thing, except we're using a digital model, and we're carving away what's not the part out of the block of material, as opposed to 3D printing, where we're building, uh, building the part up. So here, I, on the left-hand side, we have a 3D printer. That's what printed the, the plastic part. Uh, the scale is actually a little bit wrong. The 3D printer's actually smaller in comparison to the CNC machine. Uh, but that part, the plastic one, was printed on a quarter million dollar 3D printer. It took uh, $65 worth of the special plastic that can run in the 3D printer and uh, was in there for two and a half hours. In contrast, the, the block of aluminum that we put in the Haas machine uh, was seven, eight dollars. And uh, we ran it in seven minutes. So considerably less time. The machine is about a $65,000 machine. So there's, there's obvious advantages to both. When it comes to production and accuracy, you're going to find subtractive a lot better. When it comes to shape complexity, that's where 3D printing starts to win. And you'll see as we go through the processes of CNC, it's dictated by where you can get a cutter, where with 3D printing, shape complexity kind of comes for free. Does that make sense? But for volume kind of stuff, uh, CNC is, is considerably faster. What's kind of pushing the edge of where things are going, but it's kind of interesting, there's some technology now where, where people are combining subtractive and additive together, so building up a shape with subtractive and then machining, machining accurate uh, surfaces. So this, this is actually a car that was done live at uh, IMTS, a big manufacturing show. Okay, so enough about the subtractive stuff. Let's take a look at uh, some actual machining processes. So to start, there's, there's kind of two fundamental uh, ways of machining. They're what we refer to as milling, where you have a cutter that's spinning, and uh, the part, either the cutter moves in relationship with the stock or the stock moves underneath it, but you have a cutter that's moving through stock that's spinning. So as a result, a little design for manufacturing trick, or, or tip that you need to know if you're designing something that's going to be CNC cut, uh, you need to have radiuses in the corners. I've had people say, well, why can't you put a square cutter in the machine? Well, the square cutter is going to spin, so it'll still leave a radius in the corner. 
Uh, so you need to design parts with radiuses in a corner so a tool can get in there. But there's lots of tricks you can use to relieve pockets and things if you need something sharp to get in. On the other hand, turning is where you're going to spin the part and the tool uh, is stationary and it runs through the part. So you end up with uh, round parts like this one. So the part spinning in the tool uh, cuts the stock. Does that make sense, the difference between milling and turning? Perfect. All right, so let's watch our first video. So this is uh, some footage from uh, Pier 9 where we're cutting the part. A couple of things you might notice. Uh, there's a part on both sides. So we're machining the top half of the part, and then we're machining the bottom half of the part. So you can see on one side we machine the top, and then we flipped it over and machined the back side. So it's another thing we have to keep in mind uh, when you're milling something. You have to be able to hold on to the part. It's always a lot of fun to see the chips flying off. But we're, we're taking a block of material and we're removing the material that we don't want from that block of material. You'll see things like tool changes happening. So this machine has a carousel of tools and you pick what tool you want it to use and it's going to grab that tool out of the carousel. The last operation is going to come in and thread a hole. So it's actually synchronizing the speed of the spindle uh, with how far it's going down. And if you look at the part, there's actually threads you can thread a bolt into. So it's a high level of accuracy, the machining process. So the, the water jet, uh, by and large, is to get chip evacuation. There was, there was a period of time where water, the, the water, we call it the coolant, played a big factor in keeping the tool uh, cool. Uh, today, most cutters actually work better if you take an aggressive cut and it puts the heat into the chip. Um, so for the most part, we use the coolant to get the chips out of the way. Uh, especially something like aluminum, we can remove material so fast that if you don't get it out of the way, you end up double cutting it and then you can't be as efficient with your cutting process. Does that make sense? So a quick uh, other thing that I want to notice too, so as we start talking about milling, then you start talking about how many axes is the machine. So if you went to Pier 9, you probably, everybody probably stopped in front of the big mooring and said this machine's 11, an 11 axis machine. So it's the number of axes the machine can move in. We'll talk about that later, but that, that machine's really two machines stuck together. Um, machining starts at what we would call two and a half axis, which is what this part is. Uh, the half axis is actually something that uh, cam guys sort of came up with to differentiate our products. Um, but really what we're saying is we're doing all of our cutting in the XY plane and the Z axis is just used to position down to a depth. So you end up with prismatic parts. Now to break the rule a little bit, we are helixing into a pocket so you get three axis moves. But if you hear people talk about two and a half axis machining, you're talking about prismatic parts where the tool is going to a depth and then doing all the cutting on one plane. Does that make sense? Perfect. So let's watch our next video. So now when we start talking about three axis machining, we're starting to use a ball nose end mill and we're creating a topology or a free form surface where we're using all three axes at one time to machine the surface of a part. So when we talk about three axis machining, it's the same physical machine. The machine does, has to have the third axis to get down. There's no difference. The difference between two and a half and three axis is merely a software limitation we've done to differentiate what the products are. So the next is uh, what we call four axis, and you'll see the part do a quick spin at the beginning. It's already done. So now we have a three axis machine that has the ability to rotate a part around so we can get at multiple sides of it. So again, I'll show it. Uh, again, this is a robo drill machine, so it's super fast. But at the very beginning, you see it rotate the part around. So now instead of just being able to get at one side, we can tip the part over and get at the other side. So now we start talking about three and then plus one. So I know our math in the cam world is a little funny. We call it a half axis when it's positioning to Z. And when it's a positional rotary axis, we call it plus one and plus two. So there's all kinds of weird little lingo things with our business. Uh, but that's what we're calling three plus one. So now naturally, what do you think will happen with three plus two? Now we can move it in multiple axes. So we can tip a part over and machine here and tip it over and machine here and tip it back up and machine here. Um, it doesn't mean you can machine a part that's any more complicated, but instead of having to put this part in a vise and machining it from here and then have somebody open the door and flip it over and put it back in another vise, now the machine can tip the part around and get at whatever side you want. So now we have what we call three plus two. 
that anybody would probably say, well, that's five axis. But when a CAM guy or a CNC guy says five axis, they're talking about something different than three plus two. So three plus two is I'm just positioning, and then all my cutting is in three axes. Does that make sense? It, the, the truth is the vast majority of five axis machining is plus two because it's a lot faster. As soon as we start surfacing, you saw that part we were surfacing, it takes a lot longer to create a shape. So we try and make prismatic shapes that kind of come at different angles. And that's where uh, the three plus two comes in. We're making sense so far? So when I use the word prismatic, and if somebody says I'm wrong, that's okay. I'm talking about shapes that are created with cuts, extrudes, and bosses. So it's kind of vertical walls and okay. normal shapes. Is that how you, you'd use the word too? I guess it works. Okay, it's all good. <laughs> Sometime uh, machinists use words in funny ways. So anyway, um, this is, uh, any guesses? Well, I wrote it on the side. This is turning. So now we can see the tool is coming in. Uh, relatively stationary in the part spinning. So naturally, every part we create is going to be round when you're spinning the part. Uh, you're also seeing in, in the video, uh, we can see uh, the tool change is a little different in most turning machines as well. Let's uh, play it again. Uh, so this whole carousel is a tool changer. So now to change a tool, it's backing off and spinning to get another tool in there. But again, it has a, a set of tools that it can uh, spin around and get to. So as we get a little more complicated, if you hear about milling and turning, now again, we're reducing the number of times you have to set a machine up and putting it in multiple sh machines. In this case, we're performing milling operations uh, inside of the lathe. So we can see it's instead of spinning the part, now we have a milling cutter and we can come in and add features, milled features to a, a part that was a, a spun part. So Hans made us a nice little part at Pier 9. I stole it off his desk before the meeting, so thank you. Uh, this is an example of a mill turn part. We've turned the outside, and then instead of having to take it out and put it in another machine and have an operator do that, uh, the machine came in and did the milling operations on the, on the back side of it. So we can just pass that around so you can get a feel for, for how that is. And I think you can constantly see the theme of what we're trying to do is make the machines more and more complicated so that... Uh, there's less and less operator intervention. The less time a human touches it, the more accurate the part can be and, and the more we can drive costs down. Incidentally, that's driving a lot of our business because companies are now saying, I can manufacture in America because it costs the same amount to put a machine there and the part's coming out of the machine finished. So it's, it's driving a lot of what we're calling onshoring. So now uh, we're going to run true five axis. So now we're, it's, the same machine, you're actually going to see it again later. Uh, this is the machine at Pier 9 where we're using all five axes at the same time. So when we talk about five axis, we're talking about all five axes at the same time. You might do three plus two on the machine, um, but when we say three plus two, what do we mean? We're positioning in two axes. When I say five axis or true five axis, we're talking about using all five axes at once. So this was uh, Iron Man's head that we made at at Pier 9. Incidentally, we made that, uh, we, we came up to set up the post processor, and I'll jump into that a little bit later, but we came up to set the post processor for Pier 9, which is how we communicate with the machine, and we thought, well, we have to, we have to run something on the machine now that we got it all set up. And somebody walked by and said, you should make Iron Man. Uh, so my intern hopped on GrabCAD and downloaded the model and machined it up. But the process of programming, it was about an hour. Uh, okay, so we've kind of covered a couple of the different types of machining. Uh, we'll look at some machines, and I'm going to try and quiz some people along the way too. Uh, so we'll we'll ask some questions about what what kind of machining is happening. So be ready. So as we as we kind of look at, we had three axis machining, we had two and a half axis machining, we had three plus one and three plus two, and all all these sorts of things. Now they they correlate to machines. So uh, the most common CNC machine would be a vertical mill. So why do we say it's a vertical mill? The spindle is vertical, um, and it's typically a three-axis machine. So even though it's a three-axis machine, you could use it for what we call two-and-a-half-axis machining. 
It's again a limitation to what we've sent, what code we've sent to the machine, uh, or you could do surfacing. But a vertical mill would be the most common type of uh, machining centered, uh, coupled along with a, a router. Uh, incidentally, the the difference between a router and a, a mill is pretty subtle. They all have, they both have three axes or multiple axes. The simplest way of describing the difference is one is very rigid, so for cutting heavy materials. And, and the other is usually a welded frame and typically used for things like foam and wood. Uh, but other than that, the process of programming them is the same. You're still driving three axes. The application is usually a little different because it's cabinets versus car parts, um, but more or less the same. So a rotary axis, we saw that in the video where we added a fourth axis or we could add a fifth axis to the table of a vertical machine. So now that gives you an ability to rotate the part over, maybe have multiple parts or get another side of the part. Uh, next, the production machines. I've got a neat video of that coming up. Uh, we call it a horizontal machining center. So any guesses on why it's called a horizontal machining center? The spindle's horizontal, exactly. The tool's coming in horizontally. That tool's coming in vertically. Um, how many CAD people are in the room? Hopefully lots. So incidentally, the z-axis is always pointing at the spindle. So in the case of a lathe, the z-axis is pointing at the spindle. In the case of a vertical mill, z-axis is pointing up. In the case of a horizontal mill, z-axis is pointing at the spindle. So z is always at the spindle. Yes? So it can be referred to as a couple different things. Uh, the, the quick rule is we use the Cartesian coordinate system, so we have x, y, and z. And then uh, we have x, y, z, and a, b, c. So a, b, c rotates around x, y, z. As an added little trick most of the CAD people know, but you could add to that RGB is XYZ is ABC. So the colors of the axes are RGB, the axes are XYZ, and then ABC are the axes that rotate around them. So we call them a rotary axis. In this case, that would be an A axis because it's rotating around the X axis of the machine. This would be a B axis typically because it's uh, mounted in Y. So then a five axis mill we saw that video where it's got five axes to position the part, whether it's positional or uh, true five all at once. A lathe is what we refer to as a machine that's turning apart, much like a, a wood lathe, uh, but of course more rigid. And then mill turn again is where we're combining milling and turning together. Uh, to take it a step further, we have that multitasking machine at Pier 9 where you ask the question, what are the rotary axes? Well, if you add them all up, you end up with six axes. How do we have an 11 axis machine at Pier 9? The truth is it's two machines put together. So you machine the front half of the part and then it passes it to the, the other machine inside the same envelope and machines the back half of the part. So if you're wondering how, how is there an 11 axis machine, it's, you can think of it as two machines that are all in one envelope and parts come out finished as opposed to taking it out and flipping it over manually. And then finally we have uh, water jet, I know Greg did a talk on, on water jet. There's different technologies that use, uh, sometimes we call it beam cutters. They use, either use a water jet or a, a laser or a plasma beam uh, to cut. When I say water jet, uh, a lot of people wonder, well, how does a, how does a water jet cut? It's, it's not actually the water that's cutting. We, the water is just the binder, and then there's sand or glass particles inside the water. But the water, it's a jet of water with sand inside that does cutting. Again, if you walk by Pier 9, there's some nice examples of four inch thick blocks of aluminum that have been cut with, with the water jet. So this is a uh, video from Pier 9. Now let's get it playing. Uh, this, this incidentally is what our adaptive clearing uh, it's something that Autodesk is, is well known for and was part of the acquisition when they bought HSM Works, the team I was a part of. Uh, but it's a roughing algorithm that always cuts the same amount of material off the stock. We got a neat little video that I, I did at Pier 9 that explains it in, in full. But if you look at all the chips, they'll all be the same size because it's taking the exact same amount off uh, every time. But again, we're on a vertical milling machine. Uh, the cutter that we have in there is is a uh, cutter that can actually tell us in real time how much load the cutter is seeing. Um, so we can use it for calculating the tool. So now the first question, is this two axis, two and a half axis, three axis, four axis, any guesses? Two and a half, yeah. two and a half perfect. So you saw some little micro lifts in there. 
um, which was the, the kind of half axis positioning where that tool lifts up, but the cutting's all happening in X and Y. So it'd be a, a good example of two and a half axis milling. Pardon? So uh, the main reason it lifts up is that we're not dragging across the, the finished surface. I, I've had people often look at parts that were roughed out and say you're leaving a bad surface finish. The reality is the, the job of the roughing toolpath is to get material out of there as fast as possible, which usually means you're pushing so hard there's some cutter deflection and things. So you just don't want to drag across a surface that you've been on uh, already. So it's, it's common to do with, with roughing toolpaths. So uh, this is an example of actually a fifth axis that you can mount on a vertical machining center where it's mounted and it can rotate uh, around in two different directions to get multiple sides of the, the part. So you can retrofit uh, older machines to do four and five axis things which add to a level of complexity that you'll see a little later on. So what we're now watching is inside of a horizontal machining center. How many axes do you think this one is? Three plus one, exactly. We're doing our cutting really in three axes, and then um, you saw that fourth axis that rotates around. So now we've got two parts on that side, two on that side, so all the way around. There's eight parts loaded on this machine. The other interesting thing, and I kept the video short, maybe I should have left it longer, with four axis machines, you may actually notice sort of this half round in the wall. The whole uh, horizontal machining center can often switch the pallets so that once it's done with all these parts, it rotates around and then it's running this pallet and the operator can load the other pallet. This particular machine is actually hooked up to what we call a pallet pool. So then it switches the pallets and puts it up in a big uh, pallet system so you can have 120 pallets loaded up. So literally an operator comes in the day and loads up 120 pallets, shuts out the lights and goes home and it runs parts all night long, kind of swapping it out and there's a station where they load it. So the, the goal of the horizontal machining center is keep the spindle going as, as much as possible. And the spindle's not turning, the machine's not paying for itself, so they're continually loading pallets into the machine. So what would you say this is? Three axis, four axis? Three plus two, close. We'll watch it one more time. So this is that funny little thing that machinists do. Uh, this is five axis because we we're using all five axes at once. The rotary axes were moving while we were cutting. So it's kind of the extent of complexity before you get to multitasking machines. Now, this same machine could be used as a three plus two machine. You could position and drill a hole or cut a feature, but that particular video we are running uh, all five axes at once. So now, uh, any guesses? Three plus two, five axis, four axis? So I, I caught you again. This, this one was actually three plus two. We saw this machine doing five axis. Why is it three plus two? It did its positioning over here, and then it came down, and it's going to do all its cutting in that funny plane. So all the cutting's happening in this, this angle. The reality is we cut the whole Iron Man's head in three plus two. So a lot of people think, oh, five axis is super complicated. The reality is most of it can be broken down into what we call three plus two. From this angle, machine what I can. From this angle, machine what I can. From this angle, machine what I can. So it's, uh, the process of machining is about looking at a complex part and how do we break it down into a, a set of simple strategies. So again, that was three plus two. And then this is an example of a router uh, because it's a less rigid machine. Uh, you wouldn't put steel in there. Um, it, it's also a good example of sort of the different ways machines can work. The last five axis machine we saw, the tool was moving up and down, and the part was rotating. So that's what we would call a table-table machine. The two rotary axes are happening in the table. 
Uh, if we were to look at the, the router, we would call that a head-head machine because the two rotary axes are happening in the head. The reality is, from a programming standpoint, it doesn't really matter. We're just controlling the angle of the tool in relationship to the part. How the machine gets there doesn't matter as much to us, with the exception of we need to understand where the head should do its repositioning so it doesn't mess something up. Does that make sense? And again, my, my intern made this, uh, so I'd encourage anybody here to uh, take the shop class and try cutting something. It's lots of fun. So this, in this case, this is a, an example of a, a plasma cutter, but a, a beam cutter where we're using uh, plasma. It's actually heating up the material, and then a jet of air uh, shoots through to, to cut the shape out. So that was a, an example of a plasma cutter. Any questions on the basic types of machines? So how many of these So how many of these? This machine we don't, but we have a water jet at Pier 9 uh, that's, that's fairly similar in the background here. Uh, this DMS is the machine from Pier 9. Um, the Haas Vertical Machining Center is from Pier 9. Uh, we actually have the fifth axis that we can put on it at Pier 9. Uh, there's a CNC router in the back. And it's called a shop bot that's at Pier 9. Uh, the, there's a, a smaller lathe. It's a mill turn lathe. Again, that part we passed around was done at Pier 9. Um, Carl's actually got a couple of his own machines that are similar to the ones at Pier 9 as well. Okay, so let's take a, a quick look at the machining process. We'll try and stay out of product in, in general, but just to the extent of how do we actually go about uh, machining a part. How many people are familiar with Inventor? Most? Good. So we start with a, a 3D CAD model. In our case, the cam runs inside of Inventor, and I'll explain why we do that uh, in a little bit. But we start with a CAD model, and then we start the process of saying, now how am I going to go about uh, machining it? But the first thing we need to do before we say, how am I going to machine it, is uh, how am I going to hold on to the part? Because remember, if you, we look down here, this is the, the work coordinate system or the, the uh, datum for Inventor which is not the same as CAM, because how we model the part probably isn't the same way with how we're going to hold the part. And actually, in the case of uh, this part I passed around, we held it once with Z coming this way and once with Z coming this way. So the setup is going to tell us what direction is the tool coming from, uh, what's the billet of material that I want to cut, and uh, where is zero going to be. So I put, I put zero up in the corner of the part, this is, this is another very important thing to when we're uh, machining. We machine the one side of the part. We need to somehow say, where does zero in the digital world correlate with zero in the machine world? So we use something we call a work offset that says, this is zero. And in the case of Haas, it's a G54 number. And then on the machine, we'll go and we'll find that point. We'll say, that's G54. Now everything for that program is relative to that spot. Now what's neat is you saw when I was running two parts, I can have two or three or multiple zeros on the machine. So when I'm running this tool path, it's relative to that point, and this tool path relative to that point. Uh, so we can have a bunch of parts. The other thing we want to keep in mind is when I flip this over, I need to somehow relate what I already machined to what I'm about to machine. Otherwise, you'll end up with a, a mismatch. So if you ever go to machining something, you want to think about when I flip this thing over, how am I going to find something I already machined so the top side matches the bottom side? Does that make sense? Good. Hopefully, I'm not getting too technical. But hopefully, you're seeing it's so easy that you'll go down to Pier 9 and cut some parts. So the next thing we're going to do after we've defined zero is we go through and define the processes we want to use to machine the part. It's not, it's not like 3D printing where you just say, go print it, because 3D printing just has one head, it either lays material or it kind of supports itself. With CNC, we've got a whole cabinet of tools and we can pick the best tool to be the most competitive. So even if uh, there was a system that automatically picked everything, then that wouldn't make shop A competitive with shop B, because shop B is going to come up with a, a different way of making it faster and cheaper and better, right? So the manufacturing process, we're going to define what we want to do. 
It usually starts out with facing the top of the material, so we have a, a clean face to reference off of. Uh, generally, there's some roughing to quickly get rid of the material we don't want, and then you'll come in and start finishing. This step, incidentally, is often skipped if uh, you've ever done the brakes on your car or something. You probably saw the caliper that started as a casting, but then you'd see some shiny surfaces that were machined. So the added thing that happens a lot is you'll cast a, a near net shape, we call it, where it's got extra material and the things that have to be precise, and then you'll end up just holding onto it and machining the precision surfaces for what matters. So there's not always roughing involved. Sometimes you're just finishing a rough casting or something like that. So then, of course, uh, we want to simulate uh, to see what's going to happen. So you'll have a simulation of uh, the toolpath going in and removing the material and getting a good idea of what's about to happen before you run the code. And the final step to the process is post-processing. So this is, this is the part that makes our business a, a lot more fun. In the next slide, I'll show it. But essentially, this is where we take the pretty little blue lines on the computer screen and turn that into a language that the CNC machine understands. And of course, every CNC machine wants to be better in some way, so they change their code a little bit to make it better, which means we need to format how we communicate with those machines uh, in the same way. So that's typically referred to if you hear the term G-code. Uh, G-code are, are the guidance codes that tell the machine what to do. So in this example, when you tell the machine to cut an arc, it's spitting out a, a G3 move, and where's the start point and the end point uh, of that? I think I talked to somebody in the room here that started CNC programming by writing the, the code out by hand. So it used to be that they'd punch tapes to tell it what to do, and then you'd, then you'd type code out by hand, and now the CAM system generates that code. Uh, incidentally, our system for surfacing, we can post-process somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 lines of code in a second. So it's considerably faster than the idea of uh, typing it out and possibly uh, fat-fingering something and having a machine jump where it shouldn't have, shouldn't have gone. But G-code is the underlying language that the machines uh, run off of. Now, to, to make things a little more interesting, uh, on the, the one side I show a control that's made by the company that makes the machine. So it's a, it's a good marriage where the controller and the machine are made by the same people. So it's very easy for us to communicate with machines like Haas machines. Uh, on the other hand, a Heidenheim controller, if you hear Fanuc control, uh, many other controls are or like a PC that any machine vendor can buy and put on their machine to run it, and that machine vendor can switch all kinds of settings to make it unique to their machine. So that's one of the complexities of, of the business. So any, any questions so far? Hopefully I'm not diving too deep. So how does the, how does the G code actually make it to the machine? So there's a, there's a bunch of different ways. Uh, sometimes it's serial port communication. Some machines have network drops. Some machines uh, have USB keys on the side of it. The, another big thing that we always miss as software guys is we see the shiny brochures with the newest machines, but it's not, a, we, we joke, but it's not uncommon to go into shops where there's machines that we like to say came over on the Mayflower. So shops have old, old machines that we still need to communicate and run. So sometimes that's a floppy drive, sometimes that's RS-232. Uh, newer machines typically have a network drop, but it's seldom to find a shop that only has brand new machines in it. So uh, market data. How many, how many people know this guy? There we go. There's pizza here, so I'm surprised he's not here. Anyway, uh, Jeff Tiedekin is, has, a, has a local shop here. He does a lot of uh, the trophies for Red Bull. He's been a user uh, for us for a little while. Uh, but uh, a typical shop kind of guy. Which kind of brings us to the next question, who actually programs machines? The, the biggest chunk is going to be dedicated programmers, but where they come from is kind of interesting. For the most part, and this is how, it, how I started, uh, people end up starting on the shop floor, and then usually it's the younger guys, which is in my case, then there's these fancy computers to control machines, so they start casually programming CNC machines and ultimately uh, they become dedicated CNC programmers that sit in a desk. But it's not uncommon for a guy to be standing in front of a machine and have cam software next to the machine, a laptop covered in coolant and all kinds of other stuff because he's programming and running machines at the same time. A little more common for the casual programmer, we see this growing a lot uh, as uh, 
in all honesty, a lot of people didn't go into manufacturing, so what we're finding is uh, engineers are now starting to use CAM systems to program, so they'll design and program. Yes? How much work happens? So in regards to um, where the market is, uh, this, uh, the numbers are in uh, millions of dollars, but there's a, a decent sliver in the two and a half axis range, so that's the, the prismatic stuff. Uh, incidentally, you'll see on the next slide, Autodesk has quickly gotten some huge market share because we've decided uh, what better way to leap into this market than give that chunk of the pie away to establish a, a user base. So this chunk of the stuff is free from Autodesk. Milling and turning, we're, we're fairly good at. Three axis is the biggest chunk of the pie in our product portfolio is very, very good at. And again, you can see that a big chunk of five axis machining is actually uh, three plus two milling. The numbers are a little skewed in that typically a five axis system is more expensive, so this doesn't do a good job of representing the, the size of the user base. But you can see that the bulk of machining happens in, in three axis. That incidentally, uh, if you were to manufacture this chair, sure it's injection molded, but that started as a block of metal that carved away what's uh, not the chair that can come together and squirt plastic in between an injection mold. So there's a, a big steel mold that was machined that creates a cavity to machine the chair. So that's, that's where all this three axis milling comes from is all of the molds that produce all the plastic parts around us. Uh, so again, the, the neat little chart, we don't want to dive too much into market data, but I think it's kind of fun. There's a couple interesting things about the cam business. There's a whole lot of players. Uh, it's been a fairly local business in that the company with the best support was sort of the cam system, thank you, uh, that was sort of gained the most market share. Uh, the interesting thing about this graph is you'll notice Autodesk only has three bars and all the rest have four. So obviously we're growing very, very fast because we didn't show up on the chart uh, four years ago. And a uh, quick little thing on where our product offerings are. Some might be surprised. We have a product that runs inside of SolidWorks, uh, one that runs natively in Inventor and in Fusion. Uh, why it comes back to our core belief that design and manufacturing should happen together because the programmer should be thinking about how am I going to manufacture this, this product. So we're tying design and manufacturing into one seamless workflow. And hopefully I introduced everybody to CNC well enough, and we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you.